Hello and welcome to the Polecat Cast 70, Nurse Sogeny Busters. Uh, while the badgers are away, the succubus will uh, play. I am your host uh, in, in favor of the doge, uh, and we have a bit of a, you know, reduced crowd here today as the badgers are still, uh, most of the badgers, except Hannah, are still traveling. Uh, so thank you, Hannah, for coming on, and as well as Scott. So we got a few fun stories today. Uh, we'll be starting off with the Swedish porn and video games double-headed dragon that needs to be slain by the she for he campaign in Sweden. Yes, you are hearing that right. I received intel uh, from what I call a unicorn, which is a Swedish porn star. Uh, she is not SGW. Uh, she clings to the word feminist, as she says, but the anti-feminist uh, bigots are, or anti-sex feminist bigots, anti-porn feminists are very much uh, trying to convince her <laughs> out of still maintaining that title. But yes, she's a unicorn. She's a Swedish uh, porn star who values reason and logic. So imagine that. And from her I found out that there is a, a Swedish version of she for he. Yes, are the, the badger uh, narrative is echoing uh, across the world and we are hearing other places trying to um, sort of come back and uh, combat the uh, very rightful criticisms that we have of feminism, which is, what are you doing for men? If you're saying it's for equality, where is you helping men? So here's Sweden's attempt at that. And we have a write-up, thanks to Max Durat, who couldn't be here today, so I will be reading his summary and analysis of Swedish born and she for he. So there's a famous line from Megadeth's song, Hangar 18, it goes something like this. The military intelligence, two words combined that can't make sense. In the minds of certain Swedish politicians, the same belief follows through when you combine the word Swedish and the word porn. Swedish porn is problematic, you guys, and it is the scapegoat being used by the Swedish women's lobby to determine why men are having such trouble thriving in modern society compared to women. While it is fascinating that the women's lobby is acknowledging the plight faced by men, it should come as no surprise that they still try to make it seem like men bolster up a patriarchal system that disadvantages them just so they can subjugate women for their own physical and mental pleasure. All of our reason in Swedish porn star, do we name her? Named Vicky Valkyrie, did a translation of an article from a Swedish publication called Afton Blade, if I'm pronouncing that right. The title of the article was, Man Can't Do It, But You Need Our Help. It might have been they need our help, or this might have been addressed to men and said that they need our help as women. All right, the article announces the launch of the She for He campaign, which is a solidarity movement to help men in social relations be able to talk about feelings, stop consuming pornography, and seek help. There are a lot of interesting elements to this article, not just in regards to its content, but what led to its publication, along with the voices behind this new She for He campaign. So here's the analysis. In a surprising move, the article notes several issues that do affect men. The things they list include the following. Men live shorter and unhealthier lives. They perform worse in school. They're more vulnerable to crime. They commit more crimes. Of all the homeless, roughly three out of four are men. Alcoholism is a large problem among men, more than women. And there are fewer men seeking help uh, where they, when they suffer from mental illness. So whether these things are true or not, it should be commented that this party has acknowledged these issues. However, in typical feminist fashion, what do they blame men's problems on? Well, men. Here are a couple of quotes from the article referencing this belief. Quote, that men should suffer from growing up in a patriarchal and unequal society is well evidenced. They are nurtured into a culture of violence and machismo, or machismo. The fact that many men are not taught to get in touch with their feelings leads to difficulties with relationships. This problem is likely to be enhanced by the internet and technological development. Many men take refuge in computer games and pornography and are isolated without close relationships." End quote. What the Swedish women's lobby seems to fail to understand is that a large reason why they have taken a pornography taken to pornography and video games isn't because of a patriarchal society that enforces macho behaviors. Rather, it is because the feminists fail to realize the role women play in helping men to achieve the positive identity for themselves. Unfortunately, blaming men for their own problems isn't going to help. Men have found that trying 
to not only meet but interpret the desires of their potential suitors seems hopeless and that the only way they can satisfy their needs in an easily accessible way is through porn and video games. Rather than listen to men dissent to the feminist paradigm, they would rather concoct a narrative that can explain away why men have their problems while maintaining their worldview. This makes sense when you consider the three people who put on this article. The first is named Anna Giotas. She is recently elected chairwoman of the Swedish Women's Lobby, which is the primary feminist slash women's rights umbrella organization in Sweden. Last year they launched the campaign hashtag porn free together with some other members, member organizations aiming to completely outlaw all non-feminist porn. Note that this is the government initiated mainstream feminist network in Sweden, not an extremist group. The second is named Ida Ostensen. According to our correspondent, Ostensen is another anti-porn feminist who is ruining participating, running, <laughs> Freudian slip there, who is running slash participating in a bunch of different feminist projects. The third is Gundrun Schumann, who is the Swedish feminist. Apparently, she is to Swedish feminism as Justin Trudeau is to the word cuck. And yes, Max Zerat is Canadian. <laughs> He's Canadian. He's allowed to say this. <laughs> she is the previous party leader for the Swedish left party, which was formerly known as the Communist Party before the Soviet Union fell. She quit to form the Feminist Initiative, a feminist party that has a Swedish seat in the European Parliament. The press release made by the Swedish Women's Lobby in conjunction with this article finishes with the following sentiment. The She for He campaign is inspired by UN's campaign He for She as male politicians and famous profiles worldwide endorsed. Sweden's Women's Lobby believes that it is time to let women solidarize uh, that even men should be freed from patriarchy. Want to contribute to men's liberation? Make your voice heard during She for He. Well, end quote. Well, I agree. To think that we should make our voices heard, and maybe we should start by letting she to listen to he in regards to his feelings surrounding the concept of patriarchy. Maybe in regards to, I don't know, how it doesn't exist in the Western world. And discuss. Hey, the one thing that really gets me about uh, the feminists and porn, honestly, is how they, they cannot look at it uh, without applying a filter of it has to be a result of some sort of dysfunction. So they analyze it like, oh, men look at porn because of this bad thing, or men look at porn because of that. Maybe they look at it because it's sexy, and men like things that are sexy. And maybe that's it. Maybe that's the, the reason that men consume porn. Well, As a man, I'd like to say that's part of the reason. <laughs> No, and that's, and maybe it's not functional. Yeah, no, <laughs> maybe I, yeah. it's completely functional. It's, it's not because anything's wrong. It's just like, well, here's here's something to look at too. It's just like, um, people look at porn because they have urges because we're hungry because we're people. You know, we're human. It's just like, uh, you know, we do Sometimes, the same thing. Just out of well, curiosity. Yeah. We do this thing. Um, it's it's okay. It's funny. I guess a good corollary would be um, uh, hunger. Because you're hungry for something, you know. When 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 you're hungry, you eat. You, people they just naturally have these urges. It's there's nothing strange about it. There's nothing dysfunctional about it. It's about sating our urges. It's just, and, and so the the idea that there's anything wrong with this is always kind of silly to me personally. It's just you know, it's just like you're hungry, you eat. You're horny, you jerk off. You fucking rub on out. You do whatever you have to do. It's just there's nothing dangerous about this. And when they try and turn it into a a dysfunction. All they're really doing is creating another problem. Well, and no, and it's, it's funny too because people who, uh, who who make porn may be making it out of the, a similar type of urge because you you know not just the part about actually having the sex but the performing, the liking to be looked at, liking to be noticed, yeah. liking the attention. You know, Certainly. that's an urge. Too. Also, being hungry and wanting to pay your bills. Um, well, there's that. That's the other kind of hunger. Yeah, there's there's well, a, a very I mean, financial. Any job you do, you do though, any job you choose, you you do it for that reason. I mean, I do my job for two reasons too. Um, yeah, we, we but, all sell our bodies one way or another. We sell our time. We sell our bodies. We work sometimes with people we don't like, as in the mainstream <laughs> porn. Thankfully, I get to make my own and be an independent producer. And there's a lot more wiggle room. But let's talk about mainstream porn. That's one of the beautiful things that recently came out of Vanity Fair. They had an article titled, 
well, I don't remember the title, but the, the idea was basically uh, as they were talking about sugar babies and sugar daddies and girls that escort and uh, basically sell their bodies to help with their student loans, the issue is, is prostitution just another job? Yes, yes it is. And one of the girls was saying, look, you don't like absolutely everybody you work with, but you do it anyway. It's your job. It's, you chose it. It's your job. You're doing it. No problem. Now, let's go back to what you guys are talking about with the hunger and the porn thing. I found that very interesting analogy uh, there um, in this particular context because what we're having is it's okay to have hunger to the point where you eat absolutely everything unhealthy and candies and, and <laughs> et cetera, and you end up being a body positive person, which feminism uh, very much upholds. However, when you have perhaps unhealthy satisfactions of the other urges, such as horniness, that kind of hunger, sexual hunger, if you satisfy sexual hunger through porn that features women who don't look like feminists, you're doing something wrong. And this is where the problem is. As we read, well, as I read, as Max wrote uh, in his analysis of this campaign, a big part of it uh, from Sweden's perspective is to get rid of any porn that is not feminist. So what is feminist porn? No, uh, I've it's, had... it's control, just like everything else. The feminist, this is another way for them to control things. Very like, much. We get to dictate what you like and what you can enjoy. But it's going to be on our terms, not yours. So yeah. even if you want chocolate, you're going to get apple slices. Like, but, <laughs> that's but that's the, not the same, though. That's it's the thing, right. exactly. Yeah. And, and very rarely will you have uh, someone who... You, you may have lesbian porn directors that Mercedes works with, for instance. They may label themselves as feminist uh, in their private or you know, public persona. However, the porn they make is considered mainstream porn. It is not considered feminist porn. What is feminist porn? I've had some experiences with uh, more of a San Francisco uh, crowd, which I do agree with their approach to porn, which is ethical. Uh, independently produced, something that you are completely relaxed and comfortable in doing. And for me, that works. For me, that is my model of, of making porn. However, that doesn't work for every single model. That doesn't work for a lot of uh, Hollywood-type uh, production companies and Hollywood-type models who congregate more in LA, and they have a bit more of a uh, put-on uh, and not necessarily the most pleasant atmosphere where there's candles and everything smells wonderful. I mean, sometimes when you make porn, things are pretty gritty on the set. And that's okay. They're still professionals. They make it look like they're you know, enjoying themselves, and they often are, of course, as well. Some are just doing it for the money. It doesn't matter. It's a job. Now, back to San Francisco area that, you know, as I call my porn, has the LA face and San Francisco soul, because there is something to be had in both groups, I think. Now, unfortunately, San Francisco crowd does go a little bit uh, all the way into, into feminist porn, which usually is synonymous with queer porn, which often is synonymous with uh, exclusively body positive uh, people with non-gender uh, binary identities or non-gender binary presentations. So it is focused on the marginalized group that does not get represented in Los Angeles porn. So feminist porn is porn that not most people want to look at, if you catch <laughs> That's the truth. Mainstream porn right. is what majority of people look at, and then people who want feminist so porn, like they the go for that. So is it like the indie film of porn, basically? Is that what it is? Basically. It is indie film, so not just for the production, but also the pe people who they choose to feature are of very particular body types, and someone right. like me, who is heteropresenting, uh, doesn't matter that I'm not heteronormative in terms of my feelings about my gender and who I have sex with. None of that matters. I, I present heteronormatively. I have very feminine long hair. I don't say that I'm a feminist, uh, which is a big no-no. And I am not trans or queer or um, body positive, so I am not hired ever whatsoever. None of the queer porn places want to feature people like me because they're focused on the marginalized group and only that group. Uh, however, most of the people that are average consumers of porn, they look more towards porn that features people like me. Uh, people who look like me and present in the more traditional gender roles because most people that look at porn, mainstream porn, are cis hetero men who are attracted to cis women or sometimes trans women, uh, but who present very femininely. So there is a very particular thing that feminist porn means. And what I'd like to point out, if hopefully I've been doing that, uh, clearly enough that it is not what the majority of porn consumers want. So it is very curious to me that it is okay to sort of encourage 
the hunger type that leads to body positivity and that is okay and yet it's not okay to indulge men who perhaps want something that feminists don't embody and that is the problem. The big part to me anyway from what I've seen uh, of being a non-feminist sex worker on the internet is that people who are non-feminist do not get anything. They do not get jobs in porn uh, that is feminist. They do not get any uh, limelight. They do not get any approval. Um, and also, if you have opinions that are different from feminist sex workers and you are a sex worker, you will be shunned as well. Uh, so a huge part of it is not just control over the men who are watching the porn, but also uh, the people that they enable, the people who they give salaries to. They're using uh, money and exposure as a way to silence anti-feminists or non-feminists um, and so that's something I'd really like to bring up as a Wait, big are we talking about part. Sweden or, or San Francisco at this point? Sorry, uh, I got a little bit lost. Any kind, any kind of non-feminist <laughs> porn but okay. yeah basically yeah uh, all non-feminist porn uh, or sorry all pro-feminist yeah. women yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, all uh, feminist porn specifically is against non-feminist women and this is all across the internet and in okay. Sweden itself as well. well. Here let me let me present this then what is okay Maybe this isn't such a bad thing, then, like that they wanted, like that they're doing their own feminist geared porn. But why is it that they feel? That, I think the the better question is that why is it they feel the need or that they feel that they have the right to dictate or mandate what everything else has to be? Though? I think that's the more interesting question. Not that they're doing this kind of stuff because you know more power to them. Make what you want to make, but why are they trying to bring down everything else around them? Right, and that's what I was trying to elucidate, and I don't think I did a clear enough job where it, I think it is because of control and not just over the men, but also over the women that are involved. They want to make sure, and a big part of that also has to do with the pussy economy, and I, I've been wanting to write an article <laughs> about this for years to explain right. what I mean. But it is a very a thing that unites anti-porn feminists and anti-sex conservatives. Basically, the, the, the horseshoe that is anti-porn on both sides of the aisle uh, comes down to how much value can we get from men in emotional pain and in, in, in money and in like nerves in investment emotional and financial investment how much can we get per single fuck so if there's no outlet for the men if that hunger is not satiated anywhere well you can hijack the price of that you know Ritz cracker to, to <laughs> recall a um, Eddie Murphy special, uh, they can jack up the price of that cracker to a million dollars, like, you know, the Shrelly, whatever, a million dollars for an AIDS pill. It's like one of those things where there's no access to a hunger or horniness alle alleviating thing, which men absolutely need. Men have a dopamine um, thing going on and, and kind of a lifeline thing. Uh, if you don't use it, you lose it. If you do not maintain, <laughs> it's true, it's factually true, if you do not, do not maintain your testosterone levels at a higher sort of level by jerking off, by having sex, etc., right. they will go down, you will age faster, you will die younger. Uh, while you are maintaining your sexual health, it tells your body that you're still viable to reproduce, you're still alive. Right. As, I, as I tweeted the other day, when do you feel you're most alive and ready to take on any obstacle? When you're horny or when you're guilty? Everybody's overwhelming answer is horny. When you're horny, you are motivated. You are alive. <laughs> you feel good. I'm just, I'm just pointing out a, a truth here. But right. what these people are trying to do is they make men feel guilty about everything, and it brings them down. It, it, it makes them cower, and it also allows for women... Uh, who are not freely giving it away like some whores and sluts to uh, extract the top price for that sexual need that men have and so that's why I feel like they are trying to take over all of porn it's not that they're just happy to be in their own little corner which that is a very problematic microaggression isn't it uh, to be in their in their area uh, they, they don't want that they want to make sure that everything is their sort of porn because that'll give their ideas validation that will give body positivity validation and that'll maintain their you know power their money their relevance really in other words, anywhere there is a market, any type of market there is, it doesn't matter what the market is, it, it, it entails, what it consists of, there is somebody somewhere who's going to want to corner that market. And, and feminists and, and other women have found that the most uh, valuable tool for cornering this particular 
market is guilt tripping people, but well, doing so is a detriment to men's health. Well, that's their MO hand. It's it's all about shaming, yep. I and mean, everything is about shaming with them. So, and it's worked for hundreds of years, thousands <laughs> of years. But uh, well, no, well, I was I, I was think thinking about this, like this this the whole thing that that uh, you Anna read earlier was kind of it, it's encapsulated in this this discussion on porn. When it comes down to it, it's it's feminist feeling uh, entitled to decide which of men's uh, experiences are approved, which of men's responses to the exper their experiences are approved, and so on. So like they talk about wanting men to be able to talk about their feelings, they talk about wanting men to be able to express themselves, they talk about wanting men to be able to be different and not live up to uh, traditional stereotypes and everything, but in the end, with things like this attack on porn and, and, and attack on men's access to it and attack on you know men's sexuality and so on they're really holding men to those traditional stereotypes and they're really telling men you, you can only express yourself in ways that we approve of and they're really telling men that you can only feel in ways that we approve of so they're not really supporting they're actually just using claims of support as an excuse to do more dictation. <laughs> Uh-oh, did we lose a... Uh... I think we, uh, Anna's muted. Uh-oh, we lost Anna. Anna, did you know you're muted? Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing it live. No, Welcome she... to Honey <laughs> Yes. Well, of course, we you wrong. can't have an episode of Honey Badger Radio without technical difficulties. That would be abnormal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're no. trying to just maintain, you know, the standard that you guys have grown accustomed to. Oh yeah. It's all manufactured at this point. <laughs> standard. <laughs> if there's anything standard about us. <laughs> we are manufactured to comply. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to the show. <laughs> have a nice day. <laughs> We're super professional here. Uh, okay, uh, have a nice day is retail for fuck you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you caught that, did you? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, gosh. So I think I missed something. Um, could you repeat again, please? Oh, All of it? I, no, no. If, oh, God, that whole was, thing? No, if I was being asked something in particular <laughs> because I had a, uh, a headphones uh, malfunction, so I was actually oh, not... No. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, you just didn't hear when stuff. I stopped talking then, and and I, I typed in done, and then it was still there was nothing, and I thought somebody else had had something to say and was waiting, and nobody was waiting. Oh, I gotcha. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah I, I don't think there's. I mean, we've talked about Sweden and we've talked about porn, and uh, if I have anything to add, is just that uh, you know horseshoe theory is is a beautiful, beautiful thing, and it's so accurate so often. In fact, um, what I find very almost uh, disheartening, but understandable, uh, is that, you know, the Gamergate folks who were basically forced into this, no, all we do to respect women narrative, uh, they uh, they have this thing, some of them have this don't sexualize Vivian James thing that I uh, heard some crap about when I first cosplayed my summer's uh, Viv version, uh, you know, the, the bikini-clad uh, Vivian since that was the only black and green, or purple and green top I could find anywhere. Uh, thankfully, they're making sweatshirts now that are purple and green. But at the time, that was all I had. And in preparation for Calgary Expo, I decided on my own version of Vivian. So some people gave me uh, a bit of grief about it. Uh, very few. No big deal. But since then, I've considered uh, making Gamergate porn because, you know, fuck lols, why not? And uh, I did. And uh, it's been received very positively until last night when it was finally done, the first episode is released, and uh, I didn't even tweet a photo from it, which is a Vivian on Vivian action, but I did tweet a photo of myself wearing the cosplay going on cam, and this morning I wake up to about 10 or 15 uh, kill yourself type, please log off uh, kind of angry uh, Gamergate cucks that are like, 
very upset about the fact that I'm sexualizing Vivian, or they're upset about the fact that I assume they all jerk off and would stoop to pay for their porn to jerk off. I don't really know what, what the deal is. But it's just that's one thing I want to point out, that you do end up having people that get cowered into uh, anti-porn behavior by these types, by the feminist types. Uh, even when they resist it on one level, they still get shamed and uh, they still they don't maintain the thing that put them aside uh, in the first place uh, which was allowing for women to be sexual allowing for people to enjoy sexualized women allowing for women to do whatever the fuck they want uh, with their shit that was the whole point of Gamergate from what you know uh, what I understood anyway obviously ethics and journalism is a big part of it too but a backlash was created because the uh, ethics that were being violated were against women and against sexuality and against women that are sexual. So it just I find it really funny and a little bit disheartening to, to see a bunch of uh, these types that uh, tell me to, to log off because uh, the salt is just too much, they can't handle it. And uh, I feel like it's a direct kind of result of of the feminist types, the Swedish porn types, the ones that say the problem is porn and video games. When you chant that enough times, uh, people will not only begin to sort of accept it somewhere in the recess of their mind, even though they disagree with it, uh, once you hear something over and over, it will maintain a place in your mind. For instance, just knowing what feminists will think about something means you have those ideas in your head. They're right there, easily accessible. And so you need to be really careful that you don't allow them to affect your behavior as it's being done to some of these people. Uh, and I'm seeing a question about links. Uh, well, it is on AnnaCherry.com right now. If you want to see some free clips or free um, photos of it, it's on my Twitter, which is AnnaCherry on top. And uh, it will be available in clip stores, uh, maybe clips for sale, maybe amateur porn. I don't know, but follow my Twitter to find out. All that good stuff. Um, so there, that was that was the last thing. It's just very frustrating to see the gaming and porn um, group be sort of have this this backlash or a, a pushback against uh, the feminist anti-porn types and that they're actually letting them win and that's very upsetting but also understandable after somebody hounds you for long enough about something it's it's only natural to sort of get defensive um, to the point of behaving like they would want you to so I don't know if anyone has a comment on that or not well you know the the, polit the political correctness scene thing it's it becomes so pervasive and so prevalent that, that it gets to the point where sometimes people don't even know they're doing it and you if you don't like stop to think you fall into it really really easily and it does become um, yeah, I've seen people that are very vehemently not you know identity politics involved at all still have moments where they like they'll they'll insist on things that are politically correct but not necessarily rational simply because it it feels bad to feel like you're doing something rotten to somebody and a lot of political correctness is about making you feel guilty uh, over you know somebody else's perceived suffering even when there's no evidence that that suffering is real you know like so what if somebody were to sexualize Vivian is Vivian going to have a problem considering the fact that she's a fictional character? Is she like all of us? Is Vivian going to get raped? You know, wait a minute. You know, how does this happen? How do you rape a fic fictional character? Is Vivian going to have difficulty getting a job now because there's nude images of her out there? No, wait a minute. How does a fictional character get a job? You know, she can't be shamed. She can't be. She can't be exploited. She can't be harmed because she's a fictional character. And so women who it's choose really to cosplay her. Oh, yeah, right. If I choose to, to cosplay, then, you know, what's wrong with that? But I, I think to me it's kind of a, perhaps a kind of an offshoot of uh, some of those particular radical Mgatows who uh, get very angry with me for being in porn and for making porn uh, because that is somehow hijack, hijacking male sexuality and, and using it against them and doing something bad to them where it's like, look, you entertain yourself with sci-fi, you entertain yourself with video games, you entertain yourself with porn. I personally don't see any difference between what I do and what video game or writers of books do, honestly. Uh, just because you happen to get in, involved certain parts of your body that may not be involved during reading or video games, which is debatable in the first place, uh, that doesn't doesn't make it any less entertainment. 
Uh, but I feel like they've been so pushed into uh, defending male sexuality that um, any kind of proof that, you know, anti-agros were right, that, look, they're just sexualizing everybody left and right. It's like, well, the whole reason we stood up against agros was that so everybody could sexualize anyone they want left and right, specifically fictional characters. And so it's just ironic, almost, that they, they overlook that, um, and, and it makes me a little bit upset. But also, I understand, just sending a wor word of advice, word of uh, caution, Guys, uh, be careful, you know, that you don't fall into the, these traps, that you think about your thoughts, you think about your actions, and you make sure you don't just um, emotionally follow whatever some assholes want you to do. So, uh, including me. Like, if you don't want to look at my porn, don't do it. I'm, I'm not asking you to, and, and you're welcome to criticize me. But if you're criticizing me simply for sexualizing Vivian, you can fog right off with that. Moving on. <laughs> Our segues are wonderful. Um, <laughs> the best. So the question is, do we uh, want to uh, cover a, a little short video as a palate cleanser, or should we go straight into uh, Ghostbusters uh, Let's controversy? Let's do the video. Right. Let's yeah, do anything that. but Ghostbusters. <laughs> <laughs> no, I want to. I want to talk about Ghostbusters, but yeah, let's oh, see the video. The video is pretty good. Very interesting. <laughs> Uh, the Ghostbusters I'm very much looking forward to because we have insider sort of, uh, thank God for the Sony email leak because we now have basically proof of uh, a hardcore feminist agenda behind Ghostbusters. It's not just some movie starring women. There are particular reasons why Feig and the Sony executives were doing things the way they're doing. And I can't wait to read, or Scott will read you guys, uh, read for you guys that write up. In the meantime, let me broadcast to everyone as we watch uh, what I decided to call a wind zerker. So uh, we've had plenty of rage, rages, and cringes, and basically everything that's horrible on the internet. Um, I would like to uh, do a little something different. Uh, have my own version of this uh, since the Doge is out of the house. Ha ha ha. Uh, I will have a Windsor curve. Yeah. We will... <laughs> Who left the Doge out? Oh, yes. The Doge is at the vet. <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, so while he's uh, wearing the cone of shame, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> I'm sorry, Brian. We love you. Uh, we bust on you because we love you. I will be watching or showing you guys a Windsor curve. It is something that was made by Flash Gits, and it's absolute win. And I will uh, find a way to broadcast to everyone. How does one do this? Screen share. Ha ha. Screen share. Yeah, there you go. Oh, yes. And now let's. Ha ha. All right. Hopefully, this is now large. Remember the 20 second rule. Don't Big and strong. That. Have to make sure to banana. Yep. All right. Are you guys hearing this, though? Yep, there it goes. All right. Excellent. <laughs> it is really quiet, this, though. Is the screen share not working for you guys? Um, I, I, I wouldn't know, um, since I'm on the sharing screen. Hurricane? Oh, wait, no, there it goes uh, again. It's, it's working. I can see it. But it was intermittently popping in and out. It's There's really quiet. Hmm. Yeah, it is really quiet, though. Uh, let me see if I can adjust things here. Let's try that. Wait. I'll turn it up as much as I can. Let's try this. I actually know what you guys. This is a wonderful um, issues here with. Uh, <laughs> We're doing it live. Tech issues. So let me try this to manage the sound a little better. Oh, what the fuck, Megatron! You that's can't get a girl. Yeah, that's good. Is that better? Yeah, yeah. No, it's perfect. Awesome. Unfortunately, you guys are also coming through uh, at the same time because I've made my audio available to my microphone. So um, just keep that in mind. But I'm um, trying to make it 20 seconds, maybe less. I'm not really sure what the banana rule is exactly. And uh, But anyways, you guys saw it's basically a callback to the... Uh, let's go back again. A callback to um, X-Men with the, with the poster and the, the female violence and all that, I think. But let's try this again. 
getting away. Don't worry, I said I'll stop it. Banner. Oh, what the fuck, Megatron? You can't hit a girl. What? Why not? She was shooting me. That wasn't a very feminist thing to do, Megatron. It's 2016, Megatron. Don't... <laughs> Oh wait, wait. Go back. Did she have a bruise? Yeah. Did they put <laughs> well, a bruise a on her? <laughs> 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 this is a robot. Yeah. What do you tell a robot <laughs> when the bruise dies? Think <laughs> you <laughs> gave a robot a shiner. <laughs> what? Oops. Let's try this again. I think he's saying something. It's 2016, Megatron. Don't you read the internet? <laughs> Comes retreat. I'm very frustrated and confused. <laughs> Banana. Yes, that is Chalk Your Privilege from Ben and Jerry's. Oh, <laughs> I didn't notice that before. <laughs> oh, fuck. Why is, wait, why is Megan trying to eat ice cream anyway? Oh, he's a robot. Well, he's on the cream. internet now. He needs that comfort food. <laughs> <laughs> Strawberry Slam Poetry. Oh, God. Ahmed's Religion of Reese's Pieces. <laughs> Might be the finest one. And of course, multiple chalky privileges. Oh. And look at the cows. That is masterful artwork. It is all body positive and hair positive. Oh, wow. Yeah, I didn't notice that either. <laughs> it's, a, it's a beautiful, beautiful Windsorker. We have yeah, somebody put a lot of work into that. Oh, my! Oh, I'm so blind! Gentlemen, I've been doing a great deal of research, and I've decided that Decepticons need to become more politically correct! <laughs> I mean, that's what you gotta do. You go on the internet, and uh, if you read the wrong parts <laughs> of the internet, huh, what happens? Be careful, folks. Don't go on the internet. It's a scary right. place. I'm a woman now. You're really problematic. And you're really problematic. You're really problematic. Poor NASA, what did it ever do? Other than be a science. <laughs> Bye, the boys. Wow, that's a cracking pair of kids, Megatron. <laughs> You've objectified me for the last time. Yeah, please, spare me, your Megatron. I can be PC too. Megatron was my slave name. <laughs> Megatron was my slave name. <laughs> <laughs> I fucking love this. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> the Offendicons. <laughs> the Offendicons. Okay. Prime, come out and face me, unless you're afraid to be beaten by a woman. <laughs> Those mouth-watering breasts aren't fooling anyone, Megatron. <laughs> I'm still gonna shoot you. You should check your privilege, Prime, before one of my new warriors checks it for you. Uh, oh. <laughs> and accurate. How accurate. Yep. Behold! Go, but I'm sexy. <laughs> <laughs> Black <laughs> bot. Yeah. I don't really want to be here. Yes, you do. You're a minority. I don't really want to be here. Oh, I think I realized what a part of the problem was to make sure it doesn't keep popping in and out. Ha ha. Yes. Learn something every day. I love that. I don't really want to be here. Yes, you do. 
<laughs> my daughter start acting <laughs> like it. It's the representative of not your shield. <laughs> right. Yeah. I don't want to be on that side. Yes, you do. You're really on our side. No, we told you. We're not on your side. <laughs> we're not your shield. Yes, you are. Yeah. Now fact, start acting like it. All you minorities on the other side of the gamer gate, you're all just suck puppets. <laughs> oh, oh, wait. Go back a little bit and do that one again. <laughs> oh, yes. That's what happened. Oh, fucking prowl shot black. What guy bought? <laughs> it's beautiful. You have no idea. Just, just wait. Just wait. Yeah. I don't really want to be here. Yes, you do. You're a minority. Start acting like it. <laughs> Jesus Christ, bro! What? What? I thought, I thought we were starting. We're, we're starting, right? We're starting. <laughs> Yo, fuck you guys. This is bullshit. I could have stayed home today. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh my god. I fucking, when I watched this the other night, when that did, I fucking, I almost shot drink out of my nose. I laughed so fucking hard. I was just like, oh my god, this is scathing. I fucking love this. <laughs> yeah, that, that's probably my favorite part as well. Yeah, I was like, Flash Kits usually does some pretty, they do some pretty, uh, some risque stuff from time to time, but I thought, like, this one, they fucking pulled out all the stops. I was like, holy shit, they just went all in on it. I was like, oh, it's amazing. I fucking love it. Gee, fellas, I don't want to be on the wrong side of history here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what? Everyone wants to be a Decepticon now? <laughs> it's, it's just Megatron with Tess. Wow. Really, Optimus? Okay. No, that's not what I meant. I, uh... He's a torrent prick as Wow. Really? <laughs> really? <laughs> I'm joking, okay. He's a torrent prick his legs! Great job, you Question. I love that whole stuff for a second. I love that they they just really in that in those like five or six frames there they just really spelled out what it was all about. It's like Starscream mm -hmm. comes in and fucking he's doing it for the money. It's like ah oh, fucking brilliant, love it. Finally free of my oppression by taking all that you have. Oh. Go girthy ass to crush Prime's head, Carbot. Fuck you, Alphandatron, you skinny whore. I. <laughs> Sexy. Don't slut shame me! It was <laughs> hey! Leave her alone, you! <laughs> and there, there you have, there you have the downfall space. of social justice in a nutshell. Yep. As soon as there's nobody else to fight with. <laughs> they turn on their own. Yeah, they fucking eat themselves. That's brilliant. <laughs> I love the same thing. I watch this movie! Retreat! Clown Street! Oh, God. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, fuck it, hell. <laughs> oh, that was good. Oh, my! That is hot! I'm sexy. <laughs> uh, I love these guys. They're so good. They just don't give a fuck. Nope. <laughs> they give absolutely zero fucks. Oh my gosh, they really don't. <laughs> uh, that was good. That was a good palate cleanser for sure. Indeed, indeed. Uh, and actually, speaking of turning on their own, um, I do have a little bit of something we're not going to necessarily go into, but if anyone's interested, there's a video known as The Dark Side of BuzzFeed, and it is by uh, this woman named Cat Black, I believe. Um, and she has shown, um, she has mentioned the video, uh, here's what it looks like in the title of it. It um, mentions um, that she was a BuzzFeed contributor for two videos and um, then details all the ways in, we, in which uh, 
BuzzFeed is actually terrible to people of color and continues to exploit them and all in favor what? of the two white guys that are I mean, maybe we could have a cringe joker. I don't know, because this video is something else. Um, I let you watch it on your own uh, time. It is, yes, a Cat Black, who's a contributor, was uh, mentioning how um, the two white guys at the top are the ones who make all the money, and none of the people of color contributors are paid. They're paid in exposure. They're not actually paid in money. And it's basically just another scam um, to use uh, voices that are popular, uh, marginalized voices that are popular, in order to uh, earn more money for BuzzFeed. So, so you're telling me BuzzFeed is being scumbags, basically. Yes. Uh, really? Are you sure about this? Mm, let me check my notes. <laughs> yes. Yes. I don't know. This is a hard pill to swallow, Anna. This is, you know. I, I might take you some time. I understand. This is yeah. very. I'm gonna need a whole. I'm gonna need a very large glass of water to try and wash this down with. <laughs> so good luck with that. Uh, so you guys can check. <laughs> it's, it's definitely not vodka. Yeah, right. It's just water. I'm going to have to be a lot more numb to believe this. <laughs> yes, yeah, so that's the thing. Shocking. It's just shocking, I tell you. Indeed. Um, but uh, you guys can check that on your own. So um, from there, we got some Ghostbusters goodies. Uh, if yeah. not, uh, take us away. Let's do some Ghostbusters. Is this the, did Airwake do this for us? I'm sorry, say that again? I believe Airwave did the write-up for us. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Yes. All right, well, thank you to Airwave. So, all right, so uh, if you haven't seen it yet, um, there is a YouTube channel called Midnight's Edge, and uh, they do breakdowns and, you know, look behind the scenes, kind of a little bit deeper looks into things, um, and they did one about the Ghostbusters controversy, and Airwave has done this, uh, a little summary about this. Um, okay, Ghostbusters, the controversies behind the movie is a YouTube video that was created by Midnight's Edge in order to summarize all rumors and controversies of any significance that transpired during the production release of Paul Fegg's Ghostbusters. The video itself is <clears throat> excuse me. The video itself has been broken down into the following sections. The early development of Ghostbusters 3 under Ivan Reitman, how Paul Fegg's Ghostbusters wound up getting made instead, Sony's plans for a shared Ghostbusters universe, the rumors that the original cast were strong on to participate the rumor production trouble and story synopsis, and the perceived outcry over the female cast. In the early development of Ghostbusters 3 under Ivan Reitman section, uh, we were told the original script for the 2016 Ghostbusters remake, written by Dan Aykroyd in 1999, went through several rewrites over the course of the next decade, but never got off the ground because, according to Harold Ramis, nobody at Sony was motivated to pursue it. However, in 2009, Atari released Ghostbusters the video game based on the plot of Aykroyd's <coughs> Uh, Ghostbusters 3 script, and it quickly sold over a million copies. As a result of the game's success, Sony decided to reconsider making Ghostbusters 3. In the in the How Paul Fegg's Ghostbusters remake wound up getting made instead section, the video goes on to say that Sony executive Amy Pascal was unhappy with the Ghostbusters 3 script, and more importantly, unhappy that Ivan Reitman currently had control over the production of the movie itself. In a series of hacked email leaks, the motives of Pascal to remedy the circumstance became apparent. She would force Reitman to step down from his position as director so that she could replace him with Paul Fagg, a director who would much more likely, uh, who was much more likely to see eye to eye with her. In the Sony's, in the Sony's plans for a shared Ghostbusters universe, we found out that Fagg sends Pascal a pitch to describe what his vision of the Ghost, Ghostbusters movie is, while <clears throat> while also mentioning how this movie would be the first of several additional movies in what amounted to a Marvelverse esque uh, universe based on the franchise, much like what Disney has recently done with the Star Wars universe. Uh, Pascal responds to Fagg's ideas with approval, thereby officially turning Ghostbusters 3, the sequel with a good script, into Ghostbusters, the remake with a horrible intentions. Uh, in the rumored production trouble and story synopsis section, we learn that an anonymous 4chan user had posted insider information about the movie, claiming that it was a train wreck nearly one month before the first trailer had even been released to the general public. Normally, such a post would be taken with a grain of salt, but as time went on, the leaked information continued to match up with future events. In addition, a second poster on Reddit, claiming to be a member of the post-processing team, leaked details about the movie's plot, all of which turned out to be completely accurate later on. In the rumors that the original cast were strong-armed to participate section, the video continues by noting that some anonymous 4chan user who had proven to be correct earlier had also posted information indicating that the previous cast members had been forced into participating with the remake. 
Indeed, one leaked email suggested that the aggressive litigation be used uh, be used to coerce Bill Murray into cooperating with Sonny, while yet another email described Dan Aykroyd as being on the warpath when he heard that Fag was going to direct a female-centric Ghostbusters film. Finally, in the perceived outcry over the fema female cast section, we hear about how the first Ghostbusters trailer became the most disliked YouTube movie trailer of all time, and that the reason this trailer and many trailers to come were looked upon so poorly had to do with misogyny on the part of those being critical of them. Even constructive criticism with no relation to the cast itself was dismissed as such. In fact, there has only been one person associated with the movie thus far who has addressed its detractors without labeling them as misogynist, original Ghostbusters director Ivan Reitman. And that is the write-up from Airway, so thank you again for that, sir. I appreciate that. So... Let's talk about Ghostbusting, shall we? Let's do it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I actually watched the video. Um, so um, same. Yeah, um, and I'm not sure if you have Hannah or not, but it, it, you know, he uh, Arrowig summed it up pretty well, and uh, it is just uh, it warrants a watch um, just to see some of the actual details and the way things were phrased by Feig uh, to Pascal and the way uh, Pascal, uh, you know, her into it idiosyncratic way of, uh, of emailing in, right. in all caps with no punctuation and spelling errors. And, uh, drunken or likely drunken, you mean? Likely like? drunken. <laughs> and, and she was very happy. She's, uh, she's been uh, you know, a proponent of uh, kind of the idea that women can do it better. Uh, and you know, not so much in so many words, but uh, in response to Paul Feig's information um, or ideas. And Paul Feig himself has been uh, quoted as saying that you know he just always preferred women. He never got along with guys. He doesn't understand guys. Uh, he likes women much more. And so um, it's a very, if not a overly feminist, because I'm not, I'm not sure if I recall if he called himself a feminist or not, but it's an overly gynocentric uh, attitude anyway, yep. uh, to the point where women can do it better than men kind of uh, approach. So um, it's kind of dishonest, I feel like, to say that uh, detractors are misogynist when you are going into it fully um, actively making it a feminist thing in the first place. So you're already pushing, you know you're pushing buttons and then when there's a perhaps even an appropriate response, which I'm not saying that's what the entirety of the backlash was. There's a lot of people who are simply not happy with the reboot options and lack of Ivan Reitman and all these things. Um, lack of the original cast, because the, the original one was of the cast, the old cast, handing the reins to a newer um, group. New generation. And, uh, new generation, right. It had three guys and one girl. That was the original script of Ackroyd's. And I got changed to the point where it's uh, basically a re reboot instead of Ghostbusters 3, which was yeah. the original. And I feel like if it was... Ghostbusters 3, a lot of people would be more happy with that, but because it's a straight-up rewrite with unnecessarily, not just all women, but you're also including that one male character who's obviously uh, like right, an idiot um, eye candy, which is if you're making a parody of male movies, uh, then are you rightfully saying that hot women who work as secretaries are dumb? I mean, or is that also <laughs> part of your, is that part of your deep, deep sarcasm? I, I really it's, don't. Wait, actually, I think it's it's not even sarcasm at this point. I think that it's like they're, they're using tropes. I guess we could accuse them of troping, can't we? Right, but is it done as a satire, or is it because they truly believe that? It's, it's like almost well, a law at this point. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, here's the thing, though. It's like when you when you look at the history, I think it's I think it's great that Midnight's Edge actually made the video that he did because it's been a while since the Sony uh, the email leaks and the hack happened, and I think people have forgotten most of the information that came out from that. Mm -hmm. um, when and he does a, he does a really good job of pointing out when if you look at the uh, the initial fan reaction, it wasn't about sexism or misogyny or anything else. And where have I heard this before? Um, <laughs> But, you know, stop me if you heard this before. <laughs> um, but basically, the fans were upset because Pascal was trying to push out Ivan Reitman from the production process. Um, she was trying to basically... She was Hollywoodifying the movie. It's like they had a good concept, they had a good idea, and like most people in Hollywood, they think they fucking know better or they have their own agenda to push or whatever it was. So I think it was great that Midnight actually pointed out this stuff and reminded people what was going on because the initial outcry was for the fact that Ivan Reitman was being forced out of the production and fans were upset about this and I think rightfully so. Um, so the weird thing was it's like 
at what point did it become this this you know this uh, dog whistle about misogyny? Because it's like I don't know if anybody remembers this, but we've seen this before in recent years where something that had a you know and has still has a very legitimate foundation was turned into sexism, misogyny, uh, as a dog whistle to get people interested and get people fucking freaked out. Um, so it's just it, this is this is all hitting very close to home, you know, as as somebody who was you know part of the whole GamerGate thing. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's great that Midnight did this and that he brought a lot of these uh, he brought a lot of these uh, issues up and reminded people why this was actually happening and it's just not this thing that Fig and company are going forward with just you know pushing their agenda basically. So yeah, no, I, I give I give Midnight a, a lot of a lot of respect for what he did there, bringing out the information like that. So. You know, there's something else that's very encouraging about the way this is going, um, it, and it's it's something that you know, I hadn't thought about before. But one thing that the the Star Wars franchise in this has in common is that when these the social justice types and the the you know those who are actually making money off of it as well, um, when they tried to use misogyny and accusations of misogyny as a sledgehammer to smash any uh, criticism of their work and and of their style and everything, um, it didn't work. It didn't stop people from criticizing them. It didn't stop people from continuing to discuss the aspects of the the films that they're discussing. What it actually did was just cause people to discuss that that aspect, that use of sled, uh, of misogyny as a sledgehammer to smash criticism, to, to, to smash opposition. So instead of, um, instead of achieving what they wanted, what they actually did was draw attention to the, the uh, exploitation of female victim status that's been going on. And that's going to be, I think that's going to be the result every time from here on out. When these people try to use this, you know, oh, you can't, you can't say that. You just hate women. You just hate, you just hate people of color. You just hate, uh, you know, anybody that that makes strong female <laughs> characters and so on. When they use that stuff, that's never going to work anymore. It's people are too, um, they're they're too tired of it. They're too wary yeah, that, of it, they've re- they've and they're too the aware of it. Yeah, I think it's become its own trope. Yeah. yeah, it's become its own trope. Yeah. And at this point, all you do is draw attention to the fact that you're a fake and a liar and a cheat when you use well, it. And, and, you know, another thing, too, like to expand on what you're saying a little bit, Hannah, is that um, they are beating this drum incessantly for fucking years now at this point. And people who wouldn't have seen it before, just like, you know, for for lack of a you know a better term, we'll just call them normies, like normal, you know, uh, consumers or whoever, are seeing this pattern o- emerge. You know, they're seeing this, it's like, wait a minute, it's like, and they're getting to that point where they're like, oh, maybe there's something more going on here because this doesn't seem right. And we're reaching that fatigue point where the the normal, you know, the normies are actually seeing the cracks in these arguments and seeing this for kind of what it is, I think. I think it's it's just now coming to that point, though. So it's uh, where, where it's not just, you know, people like us that are involved in it in a very direct manner, but the, the average Joe, average Jane person is kind of, Starting to see the cracks in these in these things, and and it, it's good. It's good. It, it obviously takes a long time to get to this point, but I think it's 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 good that we're finally getting here, though. That that the average citizen is becoming more aware because they are beating the same drum. They are going back to the well with the same argument that is just completely spurious. So yeah, to to uh, to give a, a message to them that redditors who have visited subreddits. That limit comments and stuff will be familiar with. You are doing that too much. Yeah. Try yeah. again in nine minutes. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing that too much. <laughs> yeah. If you, if you get into a, a certain subreddits on Reddit, yeah. and you you try to comment or you upvote something because you feel like re- it really contributes to the conversation or whatever, and that particular subreddit is more controlled, or if you get you know flagged and stuff like that as, as as a spammer you get this um, your, your ability to comment if your karma gets too low that happens as well your ability oh. to comment and vote and stuff gets 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 reduced in this case um, nobody's going to listen to them their ability to be taken seriously 
they've, they've completely destroyed their ability to be taken seriously. Right. Because they are doing that too much. They've made it yeah. so noticeable that now there isn't anybody that, that's unaware anymore of what kind of a tool that is. Yeah. And you know what? You know they've kind they've of turned that, that drum into a dead horse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, one, of the, one of the things, though, I think that's actually going to help a lot in this situation is the fact that we're, we're already seeing it with, um, with uh, uh, early reviews that have gotten to see the previews for it. Um, it's not like it's not a huge disparity between the two, like as far as like the good and bad reviews and such. Um, it's still about I think seventy percent positive at this point on Rotten Tomatoes. But I think when you actually, if you you know focus a discerning eye on this and you actually look at the reviews, some of the reviews seem a little bit too, a little bit too positive, like oddly positive. Um, but I think uh, we're seeing like. Um, uh, what's the guy's name? Roper. I can't remember his first name. He's a, a, a review critic. Um, he used to be on the, uh, at the movies with the the other the guys that died. Oh god, I'm fucking dumbassing out right now. I apologize. Um, <laughs> but he actually reviewed it and gave it a poor review. Um, and a lot of the higher oh, like Harold uh, Ramis or no no not Harold Ramis the the reviewer uh, the oh. the at the movies the guys that died the fat guy I can't remember his fucking name but but anyway though. Yeah. Uh, really bad. I know who you're talking about, but I, I never really paid a lot of attention to the reviews. Yeah. So yeah, well, well, Roper came out. He's like one of he is like uh, I forget his first name, but he is one of the you know a, a very esteemed film critic, film critic, and he's come out and said that the movie is not good. Um, yeah, Roger Ebert, the fat guy that died. Thank you, chat. Uh, but he's come out and said that it's not good. So he is he is a voice that people can't not hear. Like they can't ignore him. Um, and he's come out and said that he's it's not good. He's an old white guy. Of course they can ignore him. Well, to a, well you know what I mean. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I did. I mean, but they, he's like he's one of those people. He is so well regarded that when he speaks about this issue, it's something that people can't like. Oh, like oh, you're you're wrong. You're a misogynist because they're not going to do that to him, and they're not going to do that to a lot of these other very well esteemed uh, uh, critics out there. So it, it's it's kind of like uh, the, I can't wait till um, the movie actually gets a wider release and more uh, more reviews come out because this is I think we're going to see a decrease in the score on Rotten Tomatoes as more and more people come out and actually start seeing it and talking about it uh, and and it's kind of funny though because they actually uh, they actually put in place a review embargo until what was it Monday I guess or yesterday uh, because. Well, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but generally when uh, embargoes are put in place, it does not it does not bode well for the uh, for the end product in most cases. Um, and they put these embargoes in place so that the bad word doesn't get out and you know and kind of sully the uh, the launch. So it's kind of it's kind of interesting though. But I'm 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 really interested to see how this kind of uh, how this plays out because I don't think these claims of misogyny and this and that and the other are going to hold up when it comes to people like uh, Roper and other film critics that are well regarded saying that it's bad. Because you, you can't you can't be like, oh, you're just a misogynist. You're like one of those damn goober gobbers. You know, it's just that, that, that kind of bullshit, you know, shaming, uh, othering kind of thing isn't going to work. So, no, I, I look forward to the next couple of weeks. I think they're going to be, <laughs> I think they're going to be very, very interesting. So... Well, that's the thing I've been saying for a while is that uh, we're getting things so um, so many things are coming to public awareness, uh, not just from the quote unquote detractors of feminism, but uh, a lot of the feminist, uh, specifically rad femme 3.0, a web warrior behaviors, um, the activism from the radical feminists that they do is uh, so absurd and. Um, just uh, violent and it has absolutely no reason to it. it. It shows them as bullies, really, is, is what I'm saying. And I think it's been enough uh, for the past half year or so. We've seen enough of insanity from that group uh, to mo for most people to sort of start to take a step back and go, well, I'm a good person and I am on the right side of history to quote Flash Kids. So I, do, I don't need to be a feminist because be, up until that point you were told to be a good person, to be on the right side of history, to be basically a, a good person who likes equality, you need to do feminism. And everybody's like, okay, I want to be a good person. I want to be on the right side of history. Let's do this. 
But then so many people are uh, taking it too far on the feminist side that uh, a lot of us sane people are starting to step back and be like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. What exactly did we sign up for here? That group is out of its fucking mind, and it's clearly using victimhood as a uh, controlling tactic. So that is sort of co coming home to roost, uh, I think, and that's what you guys are talking about, people becoming more and more aware um, of the fact that there is not just a, one story, not just one line of reasoning that's, oh, it's misogyny. Like, no, there might be something more going on to it. That word, just like racism, is, uh, I don't know if you guys know Chris Reagan, but he tweeted, it's like, whenever somebody says racist, I don't think about the KKK anymore. I think about, like, average people who are probably not racist, because that word is so overused. It's lost its meaning. And now it's starting it's to like be... It's almost like you can only call Cry Wolf so many times before the villagers start <laughs> stop running to your aid. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's exactly what's happening with misogyny and feminism, and I think that's exactly what we're seeing here. Yeah, we're we're reaching a, a fatigue point at this point where people are, like Hannah said, you know, people are crying wolf so much. People are like, wait a minute, maybe there's not a wolf. Uh, you know, we we got us. You know, fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, or whatever. You know, shame on you, shame on me. Thing, whatever. But yeah, I think people. Are, I think we're just reaching a fatigue point at this point because it's been, uh, like. I, I think in the current cycle we're probably about three years into the five year cycle of how these things generally work. So we're on the down, we're on the decline at this point and people are just they're finally seeing it for kind of what it is and kinda of getting tired of hearing the, the wolf being cried about, so Oh, it was Richard Roper, by the way, so was the critic. Yeah. So but yeah, a lot of a lot of other um like Hollywood reporter, uh what was this guy's name? David Rooney has given it a bad review. Uh, the guy from Variety, whose name escapes me because I'm terrible with names. Um, but yeah, it's it's uh, some some pretty highly regarded, uh, um, you know, critics are coming out and saying, hey, you know what, this isn't a this isn't a good movie, and you know they're not going to go after them, and that's the part. And, but but that's the thing though, it's like common sense would dictate that they wouldn't go after them, but I'm sure somebody will. So and then that will raise even more flags with the general public to be like, wait a minute, why why are they saying these things about this person that I hold in regard? In high regard, so yeah, I think the next couple of weeks is going to be interesting because at this point, I think a lot of people are are um, uh, from the reviews. I can't, oh God, I can't remember the guy's name again. He's from the Guardian. He wrote this review that was so stellar and so laced with just saccharine, is so fucking artificially sweet that it, it it was like, wow, if somebody didn't pay for this review, I'd be damn surprised because he was so on the dick about it. Um, so yeah, it's a uh, the, uh, there's there's this there's this kind of like sense at least I'm getting that people are reviewing it positive or negatively due to kind of tribalism at this point, and I like when I see people like uh, Richard Roper and other folks like him that are you know that have a very consistent line to their work and they don't fall into that tribalist type thinking either hard one way or the other. So yeah, the next next two weeks are going to be really neat to see how this kind of plays out. So. Specifically with the Ghostbusters, too, is um, that's the one that's been the most popularized. Uh, like, okay, Gamergate was the last big deal about misogyny and all that. And, of course, Paul Feig recently, it, it's happened. He has invoked Gamergate in one of his releases. And it's like, oh, girls are just told to, you know, not use the Internet because they're harassed. Well, you know what? We're not going to walk away from from our, our thing that we like or, or something like that. So I think he was alluding to people telling him to go home, gamer girl. Um, <laughs> Nobody tells girls to not use the internet because they're harassed. You tell girls to toughen up. Right. Well, some people are like, "We well, just turn off your computer." You know, just turn. It. It's like, okay, you're taking that. Away. You're splitting hairs. Obviously, they're being told to not pay attention to the negatives, not to literally not use the internet. But whatever. Right. Nothing's below <laughs> Paul Fig at this point, from what I see. Yeah. And uh, it's so other than Gamergate, which okay, we did have. You know, like I'm not into identity politics in the slightest. Uh, I'm actually allergic to it, so in fact there were people <laughs> part of Gamergate who classified themselves as Gamergate who were just flaming astards. They were douche nozzles. They were just the worst fucking people ever. They yeah. were the horseshoe of SGW, the same cry bullies, just using different talking points. So I'm not going to defend people who are shitty just because they happen to be part of a collective movement. Uh, so there were some things that Zoe Quinn experienced because people were really upset. Uh, it was the beginning of unethical journalism unveiling, and she was directly involved in a lot of it, and she put a guy through a whole lot of pain 
while completely not taking any responsibility for any of it, so a lot of people were really mad, and they wrote her some shitty crap. That's fine. It happens. Like, you can just maybe forgive, you can hold a grudge, like, whatever you gotta do with that, there was some negative uh, backlash to the Zoe post. However, that was not the goal of Gamergate. That was never the goal of Gamergate. And you had people that took it, of course, in the mass media, and they were like, oh, it's just for harassing women. And Paul Feig is like, oh, it's for harassing women. Okay, whatever. I can see why you guys took up that narrative, because there actually was a little bit of evidence in Zoe and Anita's timelines, which half of it was manufactured on Anita's part. But also, we can't ignore the fact that they did shitty stuff to begin with, and that people were criticizing them as people because of their behavior, not because of their vagina. However, I can understand some ideas being like, okay, well, look, there's misogyny and harassment right there. Okay, fine. With Ghostbusters, though, is another really big popularized, popular media, mass media going, look, a bunch of misogynists hating this thing. And the, the ice is so thin on this one. The, the leg that they're standing on is not, it's like a phantom leg. It doesn't exist. Uh, there might have been like one person who said, oh, ew, all women cast and okay sure that's not even harassment that's just somebody being upset at a particular type of, of movie that they don't want to see that's the same as somebody saying oh ew an action movie I only watch chick flicks it's not a big deal <laughs> there is no misogyny by criticizing a cast of all women in an action movie I, I mean I don't think there is misogyny necessarily I just think that you like what you like just the same as if you're not having sex with a uh, like, I don't know, Asian people, that doesn't make you racist against Asians. It just it means you don't find them attractive. I don't, maybe I'm wrong on this one, but I just feel like there's a big difference between being misogynist or something, which is distrust and hatred of women, which I will add sometimes. There's a reason why people feel that way. And the last thing we need to be doing is having more women berate them. That is like the opposite of what people who have bad experiences with women need. They need a love to see a loving side of women in order to maybe get rid of their misogyny. So that's just a separate point altogether. But I think there's a difference between not liking something because it doesn't suit your personal tastes versus not liking it because of vagina. And I think there's a difference in that. And I think people are starting to see that with Ghostbusters a lot. I mean, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, if you guys did think that there was misogyny in people who don't like it simply based on it being a female cast, because there was well, a few of those. Well, here's the thing, though. You, you actually, you, you almost hit the nail on the head there when you were talking about it just a second ago, is that, but, um, is that the, the, they're using this word, though. They're kind, of, they're kind of beating this word into the ground, misogyny, as it were. Um, but this is, this is, basically, this is about shutdown language. It's kind of like when people invoke the word rape. It's like, oh no, rape, rape is bad. We don't like rape, so this thing must be terrible. It's that it's that same kind of dynamic, except in this case they can't say rape because you know we're talking about a movie, and if they said rape, they'd seem like preposterous idiots. So they have to use another form of you know shutdown language, and in this case, it's misogyny or sexism, and it's the same goal though. It's about shutting conversation down or stifling criticism by making it seem like it's something else. So that, that's that's kind of where we're at right now with this whole thing. So. Right, and I think that's actually their, um, what's the opposite of saving grace? It's their, it's the killing joke. I don't downfall. know. It's their, their downfall. downfall. It's their downfall. Yeah, uh, yeah, their downfall is that they're running it all into the ground. They're they're putting the cliche in thought, terminating cliche. They're turning right. themselves <laughs> into a living cliche. Exactly, and I think that's why you guys were talking about, you know, glad to see this sort of stuff that Midnight Age did and others. Uh, in fact, I uh, don't know if I mentioned this, but there was a group, um, one of the only sources of, like, internet news that, that I follow um, because they're steering clear of identity politics, um, except perhaps being a little more liberal, which is I'm fine with because that's my personal leaning. And uh, they take the middle road on everything, and they prevent, present, they present it with humor, and uh, they were like, okay, you guys, like, the Ghostbusters doesn't look that bad. Well, one of the guys was like, it doesn't look that bad. And the other guy's like, ah, it looks terrible. <laughs> but, but, uh, but then, uh, eventually, after a few months passed, the, recently they released the music, the, the theme song for Ghostbusters. Oh, yeah. And they were like, even though the first guy was like, that's it, you win. All you guys that were saying, <laughs> this movie's going to be terrible. You're right. It's not because they're women. We, we already knew that anyway, but you know, now you're absolutely right that it's just a shit movie. So it's just kind of funny that uh, a lot of people that stay towards the middle or... 
sorry about that. Ooh, or maybe <laughs> that was uh, get jinxed from League of Legends as my alarm. Um, <laughs> and don't don't pay attention that it goes off at 4:20. That doesn't mean anything. Um, <laughs> Nothing at all. Oh, sure, it goes off at 4.20. That doesn't mean anything. <laughs> means no, these are not the stoners you're looking for. Nothing to uh, see here. Move along. <laughs> Move along. <laughs> but that's, anyway, with the Ghostbusters, that's exactly what's happening. They're using shutdown language. They are being, um, obviously, uh, using talking points that have nothing to do with actual criticism. They're shutting down criticisms of their quality of their content and as we saw through the Midnight, Midnight Ed, Midnight's Edge delivery video that it is a lot about pushing a particular idea and narrative from Paul Feig and Amy Pascal's perspective. They are trying to do something in particular and they're not focusing on uh, quality, they're not focusing on something that the actors actually want to do. In fact, there's been uh, in that video, if you watch, there's been reports of the cast, the current cast, not just the, the old cast being strong-armed, but the new cast. Uh, there's constant fights on set, and there's constant issues with the script because the women themselves that are filming it don't like it. It's that bad. There's zero attempt at quality and actual storytelling. It's entirely, it's it's so lazy that it's insulting. It is literally taking something um, that... Well, it's a cash grab. They're, they're banking on the name is what they're doing. Exactly. And the thing is, they're once again doing what Marvel is doing. They're not recognizing who the actual fans of the show are. And you can't just take 40 million you know, straight white guys and uh, tell them that it's going to be, you know, your beloved character and your beloved franchise is going to be completely different to the point where you don't know these people, you don't relate to these people, they're not your friends. Not like those other uh, people that have been around for like 20 years and you've watched and rewatched those movies and you love the actors and you feel like they're your friends. No, no, no. We're not, we're not going to do that. We're going to completely take everything over and we're going to still think that you're idiotic enough to pay us just for the title alone. Or, if that, those 40 million of guys don't want to do that, well, they think they can just replace all of them with the exact same number of feminist women who are going to watch it. Uh, no. <laughs> Female Thor is proof that, no, you can't no. just force people to like something, and you can't force people to, you can't force feminists to like something just because of uh, women card. And in fact, BuzzFeed was doing that, uh, that we covered not so long ago, I believe uh, during our last... Um, Polkath, where we talked about, uh, didn't you read it, Scott, where they're giving you 12 ways of, um, or we might have done that after the show, but... Oh, yeah, yeah, that was an after-show thing. Yeah, the, the 12 yeah. ways in which um, Ghostbusters, yeah. you can you can show your support for Ghostbusters. Right, <laughs> yeah. Oh, God, it was so terrible. Oh, and it was it, so of course. It, 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 they had, they felt like they had to tell people to watch the movie and to watch yeah. it numerous times. Oh, no, they, they did. did. That's they exactly did. what it was. It was like, I know you hate corporatism and da 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 da, da and all this, the corporate culture, but watch it. Watch it a lot so it makes all the money and shows people how great it is. It's like, oh, God. Well, of course, up. you realize. <laughs> you realize the reason they had to tell a feminist to watch it multiple times is because even they know oh, yeah. that they are a shrinking minority. Absolutely. That people are abandoning feminism in droves. Like, they got to get out before the place collapses on, and, and the roof falls in on them. Well, and even more than that, though, feminism that... isn't their fan base, though. Exactly. I mean, even more importantly. It's like, yeah. that's not the fan base of these films. It's like, they don't, like, like in comics, too, it's like they want to they wanna bring women in or, or whatever feminists into comics, but they don't care about comics, you know? I mean, it's, it's clearly the demographic is pointed at men who are 18 to 35 because those are the people that buy it. It's just like, it's not that yeah, even if it was, just they don't care for the most part. It's, you know. Even if feminists, even if feminists were into this, and even if, well, I'm not going to say that women are not into Ghostbusters because I love Ghostbusters. But well, yeah. in any case, you know, uh, even if feminists were not the fan base, even if fe there's no feminists interested in it, and they have to tell all the feminists to see it, the fact that they have to go tell them to tell them to go see it multiple times is is kind of a key thing, mm -hmm. because that that says you know we don't have large numbers. Right. So you have to do this extra, right? Or it won't have the same effect. Yep. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's it, very telling. It is very telling. Yeah, uh, it is. It's it's exactly. I forget what what point Scott you made earlier, but it, it kind of uh, very strongly keys off of that. 
where uh, they mention, you know, definitely see the movie multiple times. Uh, I know we don't like uh, capitalism as, as the, the feminist yeah, group, which is the, the strangest thing. Uh, that's actually, uh, I'm on a bunny trail for a second. This reminds me of a <laughs> conversation I had with Vicky Valkyrie um, that I mentioned earlier, uh, where she, we were joking back and forth, and uh, she was saying, you know, like there's difference between us, such as, you know, you're a, She's talking to me. She's like, "You're a communist, and uh, I'm a liberal, and this and that." And it was just the strangest thing to me to see a different perspective onto an idea of socialism or communism or whatever that comes from that it's a non-liberal thing. And of course, if you look at the the definition, or rather, what it ended up being in some areas of the the Soviet Union and elsewhere, uh, it did end up being basically state nanny state um, di dictatorship type thing, where it was a, really an oligarchy in Russia anyway, because you had a bunch of people all working together, and they put all of their um, you know earnings and all of their work together uh, into one big pile, and then you had you know ten assholes come in and were like, oh. Oh, this is great. We're gonna we're gonna steal the fuck out of all this, and we're gonna get rich, and all you the rest are gonna be poor, and ha ha ha. It's like that's uh, honey. That's not communism. That's not same as in America. We don't have capitalism right now. We still have a nanny state um, thing that bails out a uh, true free market capitalism. So once again, on paper, communism capitalism sounds great. In reality, it doesn't fucking work. But it was just still very interesting to me to see uh, somebody coming at it from the perspective of communism is, communism is not liberal, while in U.S. we have such a strong dichotomy between the, the liberal feminist types who um, claim communism uh, and the more conservative status sometimes types um, that, well, at least they're status when it comes to police violence, while the other crowd is status when it comes to uh, government, you know, rule of law and and they, they both have their own pick and choose uh, aspects uh, of when to be free and when not to be free but um, so you have this kind of a dichotomy between the communist liberals and the conservative like libertarians or republicans or whoever and feminists are usually with the liberal communist crowd and it's just really funny that all, for other people communism is actually the opposite of liberalism while in the US you so frequently see feminism, liberalism and communism all together uh, as opposed to capitalism. So that was one of the funny things that BuzzFeed was talking about in that article is that, or unintentionally funny, is that you know, it's like yeah you know we don't like capitalism and we don't like any of that stuff but you know go buy the crap out of their merchandise and go see the movie a few times and they, they did have the, the, the decency to mention if you have the means to do so. But there's still a very strong <laughs> Assumption that you do have the means most of the time right. because it's women who oh, no. don't you know that, have to share their money with anyone and get you know extra that, money. You know what that reminds me of though? You know like what when they said funny? that was that um like it reminds me of a church like tithing. It's like oh my god, fucking feminism is a fucking religion, and she's she's doing it right there. It's just it's like oh wow, it's so obvious. It's like they don't even see it, but they they are a fucking religion. You know, it's really funny about what they did there, though. Uh, you know, we, we, we know you don't like capitalism, but here's an example of how capitalism works. Because oh, they yeah. basically just said that that movie's de 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 uh, success is dependent on capitalism. Well, how much money it makes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, they, they were like, we know that you don't like this this metric, but they, I'm sure they did some sort of patriarchy theory around it. They were like, that's the only way our white male masters will pay attention is if we give them the money. And so you gotta give them the money for this movie. <laughs> what is that voice you're doing, Anna? I don't know. I don't know. It's like a, a, a it's, it's, it's the feminist voice. <laughs> it's kind. Of, it was it's, a kind of weird. It's the shook of feminist voice. <laughs> it was. It was uh, Captain F, but I don't know. Why. Oh, it's just we've got to give them the money. <laughs> See, <laughs> all the capitalism to support feminism. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny too because feminism, like feminist organizations, do nothing but capitalize financially, capitalize nonetheless yeah. on on social attitudes, attitudes. Oh yeah, it's yep. do as I say, not as I do. Social all day attitudes long. and ignorance. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> it's a glorious. <laughs> <laughs> and I think most people are starting to become aware that it's a shit show. I've been saying this for like half a year now on the Badgers, and it's finally starting to actually be evidenced even on the, not just among our groups, people who are more in tune with the, the, the 
the conversation around the philosophy of feminism and egalitarianism, but it's starting to spread out a little more because feminists have tried so hard to turn everything into a feminist talking point, into feminist ideology. Uh, they are, you know, shoehorning everything under their philosophy and their political movement, and uh, it's clearly, evidently, not about equality. Uh, we have plenty of proof of that, and in fact, any legitimate criticism now gets shut down as, you know, misogyny if anyone remotely female is involved. In fact, um, if Paul Feig didn't have women as his cast directors or as his uh, cast and crew, whatever, members. Uh, if he had all male who were identified as feminist, I, I don't know if that would be, uh, if they could use misogyny so well, but essentially it's just Paul Feig. It's just his ideas and his version because the cast doesn't like it. The cast, if, if I'm understanding Midnight's Age correctly from some of the information they gave is that there are reports of the cast not liking the script, not liking what they're doing, uh, being basically almost tricked into, uh, into this well. show of a movie. Trick. They were. They're contractually obligated to. Unfortunately. Well, in other words, when yeah. they signed up for it, they yeah. thought it might be something not quite as outrageous as it ended up being. Uh, in that sense, trick. I was going to say, I wonder how on. many of them read the script. Right. I wonder from how many, uh, how many of them actually read the script before they signed the contract or went Ghostbusters. I get to be in a Ghostbusters movie. Hell yeah! Exactly. Wait, this isn't a Ghostbusters movie. And which script this did they read? Ghostbusters in the name. Yeah. Because, I mean, there have been some rewritings of uh, Ackroyd, and it's like, you know, to, to be able to act in a Ghostbusters uh, in a script written by Ackroyd, I mean, that sounds like a dream even to me, and I don't even like Ghostbusters. Sorry. Um, yeah, How I'm, dare a, you. I'm an American transplant. I, I, I came into these movies way later than a lot of you guys watched it, so there is a... A primacy effect as well as a, a youth effect. That I same with Star Wars. I'm just like just just no. Uh, although I, I, I oh hell no. Yeah, uh, <laughs> the original <laughs> is worse than the newer three movies. I'm just saying. <sighs> I know. I know. Oh my God. Where can I, was, I? Where's the button to kick you out of this call? <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> I was really happy that. That's uh, not Jesus. <laughs> she has long hair, but she's a girl. <sighs> Yeah, yeah. Go home, gamer girl. Go home. I know, I know. I know. I'm, I've already been told that all morning. To just log yeah. off my. Uh, yeah, delete your account. Delete my account. Uninstall and the internet. Well, the <laughs> Actually, <laughs> I, 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 told, I said that to someone, so my bad. <laughs> that was actually me. Um, but. But yeah, no, it's it's kind of funny that uh, I'm really actually happy they did the new Star Wars movie, which I finally watched. And no, I I have uh, Intel Ridley Ridley Scott. No, Daisy Ridley is not a Mary Sue. Um, she she suffers and makes mistakes, so she's no, she's fine. Uh, but well, I was really happy they did a new Star Wars that, movie because that's remake. an interesting conversation though, because there are parts of the movie that make it seem like she's a Mary Sue, but I think True. in the next movie it's gonna potentially, I don't want to say it's going to clear all those misconceptions up, but I think it's going to it's going to bring light to why things are happening the way that they are. Right, the fact that so. she has, she's sensitive to the thing, and then yeah. she actually did it, fuck It's up. the force. It's not the thing, it's the force. Well, yeah. I didn't want to yeah. spoil it. For people, <laughs> <but>. <laughs> I'm it's trying to force, God damn it. <laughs> she's force sensitive. Her meticularidians are at an abnormal Oh, God, no, 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 don't say that word. We don't use that word. We don't use that word. <laughs> Don't get to use that word, okay? I'm not on the in crowd. I'm sorry. <laughs> that, that doesn't exist. That's not a thing. Nobody recognizes that. It's not real. Uh, also, how about the whole fact that you shouldn't be able to use the uh, the lightsaber uh, if you don't have uh, any of the force, like that one guy um, who totally used the lightsaber when he shouldn't been able to? I actually <laughs> I actually went googling this, and they were like, "Well, uh, you know, extended universe that's in the books. It says that you can use a lightsaber if you don't have the force, but then uh, allegedly in the movies they like." Work, not in the movies, maybe, but they were like correcting people back in the day. This is coming from like a di not a diehard Star Wars fan, but somebody who's been around for the entire Star Wars saga. And so uh, there's there's some uh, you know unclear information on that. Uh, can you use a lightsaber if you have absolutely zero medical orients? I don't know. Oh. I don't know. Uh, well, see, well the argument was that some of the um like all right, let me let me nerd out fucking hardcore right now about Star Wars, uh, but. One of the arguments early on was that the idea that uh, the lightsaber was activated not by a switch, but by the by the user's force abilities right. to turn it on. 
So, but then, but oh, here's that, the thing, though. They it's made like, lightsabers with a switch. Right, but now they, yeah, exactly. So it's just like there's, it, yeah, it's, it's one of those, you know, which one is better, Superman or Batman kind of conversations. It's like, it's it's really getting into the minutia of it. You know? Well, my only yeah, question was, is it retroactive continuity or is it something that has been uh, canon from the beginning? Because from what I understood, it was no, canon it that it, it, it was only force that activates it. Not that I was ever aware of. Not right. that I was ever aware of. There was, but like I said, but, you know, I've, Fucking been a Star Wars nerd since the fucking very beginning. I, I saw all the movies on opening night when I was a kid. Did so. you read all the books though? I didn't read all the books, but I read <gasps> enough of them. Though. Um, I know I'm, I'm you're a heretic. Some. You're at some. <laughs> I'm <a> heretic. <laughs> but no, it's it's one of those goofy little arguments. Like you know, it's like it's it doesn't it it, it really honestly it just doesn't even matter because there's different like when you look at different lightsabers, there are ones that definitely have switches on them and all that kind of stuff, and some that don't. So yeah, it is what it is. Well, yeah, in contrast, though, to the Ghostbusters, basically what I'm uh, getting at is that Star Wars uh, Force Awakens, I enjoyed it because it was Star Wars made for a new generation. It was basically a remake. I mean, it was pretty much, it had a, lot pretty of remake. much a remake. Like, Scavenger on a desert planet uh, has, has a droid now, and they have to go to the princess to save the thing, and then they have the run. They have the run, the exact same fucking starship run that they're doing to try to get a thing into another thing at high speed to blow up the thing. You mean the trench run? That. The whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'll be your interpreter this evening. Thank you, thank you. The things <laughs> with the, the trench run. place. Not to be confused with the Kessel run, which is also a I run. I was going to say the Kessel run, but I, I held it back because <laughs> I knew that wasn't right. Uh, he made the Kessel run in whatever parsecs, right? Full parsecs. Like, Big deal. Uh, and so yeah, it has all the same elements as the first movie, so I'm considering it a remake, straight up a remake. And to me, being of the right age, at the right place at the right time, I'm like, this is great. Give me more Star Wars movies. I'm on board. Whereas before, I was such a diehard Trekkie that I was like, and Star Wars were so over over hyped to me because the original Ridge Trish was ball sacks. It sucked. Oh, Sorry. Uh, and You're a horrible, horrible I'm the person. Worst. I'm the worst. <laughs> and, uh, Whippersnapper. The, yeah. Right. No, the, the newer movies were better because I'm like, okay, at least I can watch this without gagging. But the story still doesn't matter to me. But now they came out with a movie where they give me the storyline, they give me the the struggle. I'm there from beginning to end. Everything, all disbelief suspended. It's wonderful. I love it. Thing is, they did not really care to make every single cast member a woman. Did they? Uh, just because there's a female lead character, I mean, shit, there's some mistakes she made in the beginning. I remember she, like, was being a haughty Hermione Granger type. She's she's basically Hermione in, in this space. Stop now, trying is, to hold my hand. <laughs> which is fine, whatever. It's fine. She did the, she did her thing. Uh, she's a scavenger. It makes sense. Uh, she gets to, on a desert planet. She's going to be a bit, you know, edgy. Uh, I mean, like a non-pleasant person. She's going to be a bit spiky. Uh, but, you know, there was a lot of emotional moments there. Uh, I feel like we might have seen uh, R Daisy Ridley's true expression, uh, longingly or lovingly or whatever, looking at Han Solo character, being like, oh, my God, I get to fucking act with Harrison Ford. I mean, oh, my God, I get to be trained by Han Solo. That was beautiful. It had a lot of cross-gender fucking shit, okay, is what I'm trying to say. It didn't single out women as better than men in any way like Ghostbusters reboot is trying to do. Now, Ghost this has a, a potential because I saw the trailer. I didn't think the jokes were all that bad. There were some jokes that were pretty bad, but overall, the CG, I don't care. It was fine. But then enter Chris Hemsworth, enter, you know, Paul Feig and all this other stuff, and you're like, wow, okay, there's absolutely zero attempt at making this all gender-friendly and uh, nerd women-friendly because guess what? We um, value our intelligence, and we know when you fucking don't. We know when you fuckers are trying to undermine our rational ability to conceive and see something as a good quality entertainment, and instead you're going, hey, look, vagina. Hopefully that will distract you from how shitty this movie is. No, no, it fucking won't. We're not feminists. We we don't just go with an idea of the in-group and carte blanche believe it and, and uphold it. Because that's not how nerd women work, and that's not how nerd guys work. That's not how Ghostbusters fucking fans work. So it could have been the new Star Wars. It could have had the potential for rebooting this older-looking whatever franchise for a newer generation. 
it, it won't because it's a piece of shit. And um, real quickly, in my defense, um, I was actually okay with Ghostbusters for the most part, except for um, Bill Murray's character and the fact that he's the main character. He's just such a dick. I just, I don't like it. I'm sorry. The Cartman role, the Cartman trope, I'm just so over that. I don't think that needs to be showcased. I don't think that needs to be highlighted. I don't think anybody... It's like Game of Thrones. We know reality sucks, okay? We know there are fat assholes everywhere. We know. How about we start putting, like, positive characters on screen? I know it's not realism, but fuck you. I have enough realism in real life. I want some fantasy on my goddamn TV channel, all right? So, anyway, that's just me. But Actually, the Bill Murray character is one of my favorite oh. characters. Because it, to me, he's the butt <laughs> of every joke in that movie, and and it's it's actually harder to play that guy than it yeah, is yeah, to yeah, play yeah, like the, it. It, it's much harder to play that guy than it is to play you know the guy that everybody thinks is cool and gets everything easily and doesn't doesn't that, have that, that to finagle right. his way into I you know into, into everything. everything. by being a jerk, and then no, the the butt no. was Dan Aykroyd's character, he who's my favorite. <laughs> didn't get everything by being a jerk. He actually had to fight for it. You know, you, you kind of have to rewatch that movie yeah, now because you kind of have to watch the, the 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 dynamics between him and everyone else and you know, he he gets he gets like doors slammed in his face and shit all the time. It's not his it, it gets walked away from. It's not, you know, now yeah, the the Dan Aykroyd character is like the guy that gets slimed, the guy that gets all that's true, but no, the the jerk character gets, you know, he gets repercussions for being a jerk over and over again like that. Oh, well, that's cool. And I don't know. I see. I like. I think probably one of the first things I ever saw Bill Murray in was Caddyshack, and mm -hmm. so I just kind of like fell in love with his acting at that point because that was well, like actually, I guess the first thing I ever saw him in would have been Saturday Night Live, but. His style is great. It's awesome, and I no, I actually I think I saw Caddyshack before I saw Stripes. Yeah. I'm almost certain that I saw Caddyshack before I saw Stripes. Yeah, Stripes but it's like no, I, I do. I I totally adore Bill Murray's style, and I I think he's hilarious. And I you know I I just got to stand up for that. <laughs> Agreed. I like Murray. He's he's oh, very absolutely. he's very unapologetic in his approach. I think he understands the absurdity of what he's doing. And he just embraces it, and he's just like, "Fuck it, I'm I'm an actor. It's like I'm just well, not just that, but a as know, a so. person, he uh, well, that's the thing. I have my issues with the shithead character and its uh, popularization, and that could just be my sore spot from you know uh, Cartman yeah. uh, days. But um, no, I, I love Barry's character, not just as a actor in, in that sense, that kind of character, but his uh, persona, his personality, is uh, you know I don't know if you guys heard this was a few years back, but there was a website um, I forget the name of it, but it's something about Bill Murray crashing your party, and uh, he yeah. will straight up come and crash your parties. That's like one of his pastimes is to go yeah. get drunk with youngins, and I think that's the most badass thing ever. Uh, for so like when he went into that bar and started bartending. And like he was just serving one drink, he was just doing vodka shots for everybody. He's like, "What do you have? All right, here's a vodka shot, you know, like, whatever it was." Fuck like, okay. it. He's, cool. he's very unapologetic about it, though. It's like, and it's like, it's not unapologetic in a like, in a dickhead way. It's kind of like, ah, fuck it. We're just, you know, it's just, it doesn't seem spiteful or 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 arrogant. It just seems silly and goofy. I mean, you know, granted, uh, I've not seen it happen in real life, so I can't really say what it was like to be there, but like on the outskirts when you look it in though, it's just kinda like it's just like, ah fuck it. We're just we're having fun. Fuck it. You know, he's just he's got a very kinda kinda hedonistic, I guess, kind of uh, approach to things. It's just like fuck it, just have fun, you know, quit taking yourself so seriously. So, yeah. But again, just a matter of, you know, perception. So there there's that. Oh my gosh, is that everything? Was the Ghostbusters the last thing? Or do we have more things? Uh-oh, Anna, your mic's muted. Let me get show off all the things. Uh, yeah, Anna, your mic's dead again. You got it muted. <laughs> <laughs> Who's more driving this damn bus? Technical just difficulties. Oh, yep. please, don't, don't, don't let it be one of those uh, auto, auto driving, self driving. This is this, <laughs> this is a self driving driving hangout. We're gonna. Nobody's watching any movies right Pol now, right? Polkat cast <laughs> brought like, by I Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> Bad. Oh, that could be dangerous. 
Yeah, I, I, oh, I think so Anna seems to have disappeared. Tell us about England She's while we're bitch. waiting, Hannah. How was how oh, was it? Oh my gosh! Give us a little breakdown. What happened? Well, I, I think. Oh gosh! Well, I got there a little early, um, so I was there for like a whole day before, uh, actually a couple days before the uh, the event, and uh, we went to the uh, XL Center for a. a um, orientation and on the way there I discovered that there is one plant in, in England that I'm allergic to and it grows all over the place around that center. Oh, um, <laughs> but it was great, it was great. Well, the thing we learned that day was that we were in the safest place we could possibly be in in, in London. It was um, they, they didn't know that our we, we have a history, our group has a history of you know getting bomb threats from our opposition and things like that so they were you know they were telling us how what they could could take care of what they could cover what they had planned for and everything and then they were like not like that anything like that's gonna happen to you guys and we went well wait a minute you know so the security was really tight um, and after after we had, you know talked to them about you know this this We've, we have had that kind of thing happen in the past and everything. They were very, very uh, careful to make sure that they uh, they checked everybody. In fact, um, at one point there was a, a little bit of confusion about entrance into the, the correct room, which way do you go and that kind of thing. And uh, Janet was sent downstairs with a little sign, you know, to directing people to, to where they needed to go. And so security sees a, a blonde chick in a pink T-shirt holding a sign, <laughs> and they all like <laughs> swarmed her. Who are you? What are you doing here? <laughs> and she had to show them her past and tell them who she was and what she was doing and everything. So and that was like the the, the only thing that happened <laughs> as far so as security. So it was nothing. Huh? Yes, yes. And so that aspect of it was nothing like Detroit. We didn't have anything to worry about. Um, and the speakers were just absolutely great, uh, and we, you know, and it started out. Erin Pitsy spoke first, and she really set the tone. And oh. after that, you know, everybody, everybody that came along, it was like one great presentation after another. Um, we heard from people who have been in the movement for years and years. We heard from some people who are newer to the movement, uh, some some people who are younger. Uh, we heard from people involved with law enforcement. We learned, you know, things about. Um, well, we actually uh, Pearson, Mark Pearson, spoke and talked about his experience. Um, we had some intactivists come in and play play trailers for some films that they're coming out with that were just absolute. Oh. Like I all the, everybody got something in their eye in the room. Like, oh, like there was nice. just this mass, you know, sudden epidemic of things in your eyes watching, <laughs> um, and they're they're going to be really hard hitting, heavy impact. Good, good. And good. Uh, you know, but the, and then it was getting to meet um, a lot of our fans in person and getting to see people that we saw last year. Um, it was just it was wonderful. And I think I was the only person there that wasn't jet lagged because I don't have a sleep schedule. Yeah, I'm so I can't like, mess like, up. I don't understand you can't mess up when you don't have. Yeah, yeah. So um, oh, and and let's so, not, let's not forget. Let's 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 give a shout out to everybody that sent you guys there. You know, fucking thank you so yeah, much guys for making I, it possible. So grateful for that. Yeah. Um, I did. I did get a lot of pictures. Right now, I've shared them so far with the Voice for Men, and I've shared them with the National Coalition for Men. Um, we'll get those up also on the Honey Badger site as as soon as we can. So now that now that I'm home, I'll start uh, getting things posted on the blog, um, cool. and we'll see what what Allison and everybody wants to do. Whether that you know somebody wants to put together like a slideshow and put it up on the the uh, YouTube. Uh, account as well, or whether we just want to post the pictures just as stills. Right. So, but yeah, it really it went very, very well. And the group shot, I, we, we uh, took a big group photo. So there was a mass shooting, but you know, <laughs> I, I was the shooter. I shot everybody at the, that, that was willing to show up for the, My and God. then there, there were like three other shooters that showed up after me and shot all the My same people. God. Double tap. This um, is crazy. I, don't I was also hearing. shot. Numerous no. times. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, the the group shot from the first was pretty good for for it being the first one. This was this this like totally dwarfed that. There were well, what was many the many more people. Here? We had to do it outside. 
Um, we, like I would say we had we had a couple hundred people there, uh, yeah. and, and the whole time at least. Uh, and there were people that came and get went, so there were people right. that couldn't make it for the whole thing because either they worked the week before, or they worked the week after. But yeah, it's yeah it, and it was. You know, I'm not great at estimating the size of a of a crowd, but I can tell you that the group shot from the first one, um, it just it took up part of the front end of the room we were in. And the group shot of the second one took up several tiers of the stairs outside the, the like the the steps that go all all the way across the building outside of the Excel Center. So this was like this was probably like ten times as many people in the group shot this time. Sweet. That's cool, man. I wish I could have gone. That's really interesting though. That's really cool. I can't wait to see the stuff you guys post for it, for sure. Anna, are you back with us, or are we still sans Anna? Oh, no. I'm, I've oh. been back for a bit. <laughs> there you go. All right, cool. I had to do the, the water getting ah. bit, because it's, it's a bit parchifying up in here. Gotcha. But yeah, I caught a lot of that uh, uh, stuff, Hannah. Uh, thank you for, for letting us know. Um, I'll actually also be hosting um, the Thursday show, where... From what I gathered, I have no idea what I'm doing, but from what I gathered, <laughs> Allison uh, is, is sending over a uh, wild Karen that's going to appear and tell us about uh, all the travel horror stories. So um, maybe if you have oh, some yeah. too, we could uh, get you in on that action as well. I have a bit. Is it, You said that's the Thursday show, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, I, I have a bit. Um, Sounds good. And, and I, my travel experience leads to uh, plug Expedia because <laughs> they, they actually saved my ass. So Nice. Uh, I do actually have some good uh, good information about Expedia myself, uh, good and bad. Um, I guess I'll save it for the, for the travel stories. But uh, honestly, the only bad thing is just if anyone's alarmed. Uh, it was I, something that I didn't do due diligence in getting uh, in contact with them afterwards so they could have potentially reimbursed me or fixed something and it's probably too late now but when I went to the contact in the desert uh, convention at the beginning of last month they said one of the hotels was like 28 or something miles away from the venue and it ended up being like 39 miles away so um, they're estimation of distance. It basically don't rely necessarily on Expedia's estimation of distance. Uh, double check it through some other um, GPS mapping type thing, Google Maps or whatever, so that you know the actual distance as it probably will vary. But other than that, yeah, Expedia has been great. Um, so, yeah. Second and you're not being paid by Expedia. I wish. <laughs> Just to clear that up, no paid advertisement here. Yeah. Zero. No, so. but I uh, honestly... <laughs> Yeah, you'll hear more about it on Thursday. You heard about it the day it happened, actually, because I was late to the show because of... Oh, that's um, right, yeah. Uh, and so what happened. And that's, like, I was just, like, I, I thought I was going to not be able to go because of what had happened, and they fixed it, so I'm what happy. That? Yeah, that's that's actually uh, not quite what happened to me, but similar to where they, uh, there was no reimbursements from the hotel uh, allowed, but they, you know, got in contact with the hotel for me and basically asked to be reimbursed anyway, and so that was very nice of them. But, yeah, you guys, definitely not paid anything. In fact, I'm not even paid to be here as a badger, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I am not paid to say I'm already <laughs> things. Good, I'm not the only <laughs> one. No, none of us are paid for being here. <laughs> yeah, actually, all three of us are entirely on volunteer basis. But, uh, Mike, Brian, yeah. and Allison are, are you know, the, the ones that work uh, their ass off and get um, the patron money as well as, obviously, any kind of spending for our travel, that's, I will have to say, thank yeah. you to your patrons. Uh, I've traveled to Canada twice uh, as part of the fundraiser, so that was very lovely. I'm not saying I don't get nothing, you know, I'm not, <laughs> not trying to shame you guys, it's pretty fucking great. Um, but I just want to point out that a lot of us are actually here as volunteers, all three of us, and that we do this because we care about it and we're passionate and we have other jobs and we, you know, take time out of the day. And so if you can, have you know any kind of spare anything uh, or if you you know choosing your investment into something that you believe in uh, please feed the badger um, it is it allows Alice and Karen Brian a lot of the things that are happening behind the scenes to bring you these shows to have them uploaded and uh, you know audio fix and everything else all the good new things especially you guys are seeing is entirely thanks to patrons so if you can 
um, please consider donating to um, the Badger Pod uh, Patreon website, however it's done. Um, I believe it's uh, feedthebadger.com is the easiest way. Uh, or you can find us, Honey Badger Radio, on Patreon. And, uh, yeah, that that's really goes a long way to help us and uh, to eventually uh, potentially help all the rest of us to spend a little more time on doing the Badger stuff. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's good stuff. If you hear uh, anything you like or care about any of the voices uh, you are hearing uh, here on the Honey Badger channel, definitely consider donating, um, and we will gladly appreciate it, and you'll get an input. Uh, you basically get to provide for yourself the kind of entertainment you want. That's one of the beautiful things to me about crowdfunding and Patreon and things like that and YouTube is that you directly contribute to the content that you want to see more of. Uh, this is the ultimate voting with your wallet yeah. and I Absolutely. definitely urge you to do that. So feedthebadger.com is the thing to do. And uh, if you enjoyed this shit show of my hosting, that it's been, <laughs> you're more than welcome to come back on Thursday. Uh, I'll be doing a travel horror stories. And have me say that a few more times in my Russian accent will start coming out. Um, but <laughs> horror stories. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that's um, travel horror stories. We didn't take any horse with us. Travel horror stories? What? what I know. What? I, didn't, I didn't travel with them this time. So. <laughs> We, we've been horse? through the like desert on wars with no names. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Wow. That was good. That was good, Hannah. Yeah. <laughs> Hannah's our resident comedian. Uh, we, oh, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, but, yeah, well, more of, of, of that uh, coming on Thursday. And uh, thank you once again for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed all the things. Uh, there will be links to the two videos, uh, one I showed and the one we discussed by Midnight's Age in the low bar. And the write-ups are on the website, so go check all that stuff out. And we will. Oh, see thanks again to Airway for the write-up. Appreciate it, sir. And yes. for Max for the write-up. Max are at. Yep. The Max couldn't be here, um, unfortunately, but uh, hopefully I did a pretty good job reading his thing. And uh, yeah, thanks again to the contributors, to the volunteers, to you guys uh, as hosts, and to all of you viewers, uh, live viewers, and uh, everybody who will watch it after the fact. So thanks, guys. Keep being awesome, and we will see you on Thursday. <laughs>